Hello and welcome to the December 2023 Longevity Review, presented to you by the Canadian Longevity Association, a federally incorporated nonprofit whose mission is to help accelerate the introduction of effective longevity treatments and to ensure their free availability to all Canadians under the healthcare system. My name is Chris Linnell, and I am the founder and president of the association. We are a volunteer run organization and are always looking for more help. So if you would like to assist us in achieving our goal, then please get in touch via the links below this video. In addition, you'll also find a link to the newsletter being discussed here. This month, we will take a look at the latest results from the Interventions Testing Program, the gold standard in mouse lifespan studies, the effects of high fruit and vegetable consumption on mouse lifespan, a new molecule found in carrots, which increases worm lifespan and mouse health span. And finally, a molecule which is implicated in ovarian aging as well as organ fibrosis and a couple ways we might be able to prevent that. But first, some brief CLA news. In December, we welcome two new volunteers, Elizabeth and Taysir, to join our growing team received our first outside of the organization donation. Thank you very much, Corey. And also hosted our first longevity Christmas dinner. Okay, let's take a look at the first study. This study is the latest results from the interventions testing program run by the National Institute of Aging in the USA. And as I said in the introduction, is the gold standard when it comes to mouse lifespan studies. Now, why is it the gold standard? Well, for a number of reasons. Firstly, instead of using an inbred stain, a strain of um, mouse, they used heterogeneous mice, so mice which have a, a diverse genetic background. Secondly, they used a large number of mice. And thirdly, rather than being conducted at a single site, it was conducted at three different ones, so it was automatically replicated. And you'll see about the differences between the sites shortly. So just actually just mentioned those sites. Uh, they are the University of uh, Texas at San Antonio, University of Michigan, and the Jackson Laboratory in Bar Harbor. And as to the um, molecules being tested, um, I should just say that this involved two different cohorts of molecules uh, from 2018 and 2019. Uh, the first one mentioned here is uh, astaxanthin, which is a um, carotenoid, basically what makes salmon and shrimp pink and originally comes from um, algae, I do believe. And it's a supplement you can actually buy. I take it myself and it's probably the most powerful of the carotenoids. So, I mean, the other ones, including, you know, what makes carrots red, bell peppers, um, carrots orange even, but bell peppers uh, red, etc. And the second one was meclizine, which is a, an antihistamine, also inhibits mTOR. Uh, third one was, is uh, physetin or physetin, don't know, how, don't know how it's pronounced actually, uh, found in strawberries. And that is purportedly a senolytic and actually has already entered human trials, though the results have not been published yet. Um, they try actually they try two different doses um, or two di different uh, modalities, one being continuous and the other one being um, three days every two weeks. Because the idea with, uh, with senolytics is that you do it for short periods of time, not continuously. But they wanted to test out both of, both of those methods. The fourth one was something called SG1002, which um, slowly releases hydrogen sulfide and has which supposedly, uh, that's supposedly stimulated by dietary restriction, which is, was the original way to ex extend the lifespan of, uh, of an animal. Next one, dimethyl fumarate. Fumarat, no fumarate, I guess, DMF, which is an NRF2 stimulator. So NRF2 is um, sort of a master regulator of detoxification uh, in our in our bodies. Uh, another next one is mycophenolic, mycophenolic acid, MPA, which inhibits inosine monophosphate dehydrogenase. 
IMD, probably easier to say, used in uh, organ transplants and to treat autoimmune diseases and, well, increase the lifespan of yeast. And finally, also for phenylbutyrate, PBA, which increases lifespan of flies and has, uh, as it says, there are major benefits in mouse models of degenerative disease. So let's take a look at these results then. And only two, unfortunately, only two of the molecules, astaxanthin and uh, meclizine, improved uh, lifespan. And uh, here we're going to start off by looking at the results in males. And also you can see here, there are four graphs here because they represent uh, three of the different uh, venues or sites where these experiments took place. The Jackson Laboratory, University of Michigan, I guess University of Texas. I'm just looking at the first two uh, molecules, as I say, astaxanthin, astaxanthin and meclizine. And you can see here that, you know, there's a fair difference in, uh, ver there's quite a bit of variation in terms of the lifespan curve. So obviously survival is percentage from 100% to 0% and the age in dot days. So each dot represents when a, when a mouse died. And um, so as I say, there's quite a bit of variance between the three sites. However, when we put all the numbers together, the uh, red line is the control whereas the uh, the green is astaxanthin and the blue is uh, meclizine. And uh, you can see here that there was a definite definite shift to the right, um, though no sort of increase in absolute maximum lifespan. And uh, that shift amounted to 12% um, uh, for astaxanthin and 8% for meclizine when it came to median lifespan. So that's sort of at the 50% the mark. At the 90% mark, so when 90% of the mice had died, for both for astaxanthin and meclizine, uh, there was a 6% increase in, um, so let me sort of down here, 6% increase in their lifespan. Now, unfortunately, oh no, sorry, this is just, this is just the control. So um, the mice, which were just fed normal food, were not given any drugs, but were used as the controls for um studies and again you can sort of see difference between all um actually this is the difference between 2018 and 2019 so you can see there's just you know one year difference in the same places can produce different results again this is because they were using heterogeneous mice so mice with a diverse genetic background and you know hundreds of different things can affect the mouse lifespan even in a controlled laboratory um, experiment. So that's why it's important to have lots and lots of mice um, to, to really gain statistical significance. Here we have results for other uh, compounds in males again. Um, this this time it is the Fizetin both cycled, as, uh, in other words, three days on out of 14 days. I, blue is continuous and uh, SG. 1002 and unfortunately you can see here that there is basically all the lines are pretty much the same there's no real real difference and for the other drugs once again so we're talking about uh dmf because i started at 16 months dmf was also started at an earlier stage mycophenolic acid phenyl, uh, phenylbutyrate and a second test of uh of SG1002. And once again, you can see that all the curves, there's no real separation from the control. Somewhere underneath there is a red line for the control, but they're all pretty much much of a muchness. And unfortunately, the same goes with the females. Uh, here's the um, here's Fizetin and SG1002, much closer adherence to the same line. And for the other other drugs. Um, once they are pooled, once again, they're all pretty much the same. There's no real separation between any of them and the control, which is unfortunate. One thing they can also looked at um, was that uh, because just looking at the, the weight of the mice, there's some slight variation, but not a, not a huge amount. We'll go into that. But yeah, what they also looked into uh, specifically with the 
physetin was its senolytic activity because of course uh, physetin is um, viewed as a promising senolytic in other experiments. It's, it's sort of shown to be that. However, they basically didn't sort of see any proof that physetin was a senolytic, at least in the way that they, they tried to measure it. I mean, you can sort of see here the they measured it in the liver, the kidney, and the brain, and sort of measuring um, this P60 and mRNA senescent cell marker. Sort of it increases with age, but there's, you can see that on the left here, you've got young and then aged. You know, for that in cycling, it almost looks like it's higher in the liver there, um, but it's sort of all over the place. Uh, if you look at the difference, again, comparing between young and aged mice, and then uh, possibly in the kidneys with some result, but basically there is not uh, much difference here. So that, at least in the way that they measured it, they weren't able to find um, sort of evidence of senolytic activity for uh, physetin. But um, taken together, um, this was a promising set of studies because um, in previous cohorts, previous years, I mean, the ITP has been running since uh, for 20 years, pretty much. And for most cohorts, they come up back with no results that the several compounds or molecules that they test don't bring back any life, lifespan extension. Unfortunately, the lifespan extension in forasazanthin and meclizine was only seen in males, but that's similar to um, other uh, successful molecules that they've shown to, to be better in one sex compared to the other. So that's why it's very important for all sort of lifespan studies to include both sexes of mice, because quite often, just because of the cost associated with running mouse lifespan studies, researchers, and also to be able to get statistical significance, they sort of quite often just choose one sex of mouse so they can basically afford to do it and gain statistical significance. Um, however, one thing to mention is the fact that both for acizanthin and, uh, and meclizine, is that they didn't actually reach their intended target in terms of their dosages. So astaxanthin only got up to, I think, 46% of its target dose. Meclizine only got up to like 68% of the target dose. And actually also dimethyl fumarate also only got up to like one third, um, like 30% of its targeted dose. So they do mention that um, you know, for one reason or other, they're not quite sure why the the mouse food when they, when they tested the the food um, sort of during the course of the experiment because they sort of ordered the food in, it was takeaway mouse food. the The levels were lower than what they had intended to. So perhaps, and I think they are redoing some of the experiments at um, trying to get more specifically the intended dose. So perhaps the um, the results would be better had they achieved their intended dose. However, at the end of the day, still a good result whenever um, a new substance or molecule is shown to improve the lifespan of a mouse, that is always a good day. And especially if it's a substance I take, and as I say, I take um, astaxanthin myself, it's a safe compound or safe molecule. So um, I, could I, could, I could recommend it to the next study. And in this one, researchers were also looking at mouse lifespan. However, unlike the previous study, instead of looking at individual molecules, the researchers here looked at um, the results of um, a mouse consuming high quantities of fruit and vegetables compared to a mouse that wasn't. And um, in this one, mice were fed uh, four different diets, either low fat or high fat. Low fat diets were... 10% fat, high fat diets were um, roughly 40 or 45% fat. And the mice were either fed sort of normal, normal chow as it's called, or chow that was supplemented with 15% uh, or 50% of the calories came from um, a fruit and vegetable blend, which was based on the 24 most commonly consumed fruit and vegetables from the American diet. Um, the top five, I believe, were 
uh, oranges, tomatoes, potatoes, apples, and bananas, and uh, I guess uh, 19 other ones in smaller, in smaller quantities. And this had some similarities, but also some differences from uh, the previous study. A similarity was just the fact that um, there were fairly large groups of mice in each of those four groups, 60 mice in each. So quite good from a statistical standpoint. However, the mice were not heterogeneous. They were the commonly used black uh, six mice, um, which are sort of our, an inbred stain, a strain even. And uh, th this was not done at three different sites. It was done just at one site. So sort of bear that in mind. Another thing to bear in mind, well, I'll come to that, come to that a bit later. Well, let's take a look. So yeah, the, the mics were sort of um, were fed, as it says here, 15% fruit and vegetables. And uh, they started from, I believe, yeah, from the age of five weeks old. Uh, the mice were fed that and the, the four groups were tracked until the first group uh, reached 50% uh, mortality, until the first group, half of the mice had died. And then all the mice were <laughs> <laughs> euthanized uh and they were checked for tumors and various things like that so that's actually that's actually the first issue i had they didn't follow all the mice until the end of their lives so as you'll see the survival curves aren't complete and actually the second issue i have with this study uh, before we get going is a simple fact i could not find anywhere any information as to what kind of fat was used in um especially the high fat uh, mice cohorts because, well, I think there's a difference between saturated, unsaturated, you know, monounsaturated or polyunsaturated fats, which could change the results. Anyway, I could not find that information, unfortunately. But let's take a look at what happened to the mice over the course of their truncated lives. And here is the pertinent figure. And as you can see here, so the red is the, the high fat control mice. Uh, the dark green is the high fat uh, mice who, who are also fed uh, with that fruit and vegetable mixture. The pink is the low fat control mice and the light green is low fat plus fruit and vegetable mixture. And as you can see here, well, high fat control mice died quite um, a lot quicker than the other mice. In fact, they died faster than the um, experimenters or researchers were anticipating. They're a little bit surprised by that. But nonetheless, you can see that a well, high fat diet, whatever kind of fat it was, um, is not good for you. However, adding a 15% fruit and vegetable mixture considerably abrogated, uh, reduced their mortality rate. You can see this curve um, by quite considerable uh, margin, I think a 23% uh, lower mortality rate. And although it was early days for the low fat group, uh, two groups of mice, a, a divergence was started. So obviously both groups of, not obviously, but in this case, both groups of low fat mice, 10% fat that is, had lower mortalities at the end. And there is, it looks like the beginnings of a, of a divergence between the low-fat fruit and vegetable mice compared to the low-fat control mice, though the, the, it had not reached statistical significance by the end of this study. So, um, yeah, I wish that this had, they had continued until the end. Hopefully, they, they might be carrying out subsequent experiments to fully to fully see how that plays out. But still, interesting shows you just how how important it is, at least if you're a mouse to eat your fruit and veg. And this ties in well with other epi epidemiological studies in humans, which show that people who have higher consumptions of fruit and vegetables have lower mortality rates. But uh, obviously these are very much more controlled conditions. Humans are, are uh, want, you know, you can't, you can't keep humans in a cage that easily. They're more likely to break out, I think. But anyway, um, interesting results nonetheless. I mean, it ties in again with what we would have expected, but still it's good to sort of see this. And subs, um, other it, information that they found was about the uh, tumor incidence. So here you can see four groups of mice. And again, all the mice were sort of killed or euthanized um, after the high fat control group had reached 50%. And they were examined for tumors. 
And you can see here that uh, the high fat mice had a much higher incidence of tumors and adding fruit and vegetable dropped that considerably. Low fat mice had much lower bur tumor burdens and it might look like there's a slight increase with the uh, fruit and veg there, but it was um, um, non-significant, the difference. And again, it was early days. Remember these mice, most of them were still alive at the end and the tumor burden is quite a bit lower. One thing to remember is that most mice who uh, live out their natural lives do die of cancer. So they're much more prone to cancer than uh, we are. Of course, we we have we are more likely to die of cardiovascular issues. Next, just looking at the weight gain, you can see here at the top is the uh, high fat control. Just below that is the high fat with fruit and vegetable. So adding fruit and vegetables, at least for the first part of their lives, a reduced weight gain, though that seemed to have ended by um, the later portion of um, their their lives. And similar uh, occurred with low-fat groupings of mice, though much less of a difference. You can see that the pink is the low-fat control, and the light blue is the uh, low-fat with fruit and vegetable. And once again, by the end there, Actually, sort of begins to look like um, the uh, the fruit and veggie veggie mice had a little bit more weight, but again, too early to tell because they were euthanized so early. And they also looked at the body composition at a six month point and a sixteen month point, and initially, I guess similar to the weight gain. Uh, and initially, the, the fat mass for uh, the fruit and veg mice was lower than the control mice. But then um, that and that changed. Uh, so yeah, this is fat on mass on the left, lean mass, so muscle mass on the right. And although, although the high fat and fruit, fruit veg mice um, had lower fat mass after six months, after 16 months, again, that had, that, had, that had changed. Maybe they'd even taken the lead there, similar um, to that uh, weight gain. So most of the weight gain was uh, was fat after all. And uh, the, the fruit and veg also improved various lipid parameters. So again, this is looking at um, uh, after 12 months on the left, after 21 months on the right, and uh, much more noticeable amongst the um, low-fat mice in terms of uh, blood cholesterol lower levels, which um, at least in low-fat mice maintained after 21 months. Again, that seemed to disappear for the um, high-fat mice. Blood triglycerides, fairly similar, not not huge amount of change. Fruit and veg might be even be above. HDLC. Interestingly enough, lower in the fruit and veg and the low fat, uh, which stayed after 21 months. LDL cholesterol, uh, which is, you know, you consider the bad variety, much lower in the uh, fruit and veg fed mice, both low fat and high fat, disappeared for the high fat mice after 21 months. But as you can see here, it was maintained for the low fat mice. And VDLDC, there's a very low density cholesterol. Uh, which I think is bad, sort of not great cholesterol, but yeah, fairly similar, maybe it's slightly higher amongst the fruit and veg. And uh, the ratio better again. Once again, uh, low fat fruit and veg mice had had maintained their uh, LDL to HDL the ratio. Next. Looking at blood cytokines, uh, go through this quickly. So a lot, a lot of these were either inflammatory or anti-inflammatory markers. So MCP1, which I've never heard of before, but yeah, supposedly an uh, inflammatory marker. Lower in the uh, fruit and veg mice, as one probably would expect. It didn't, didn't last with the um, high fat mice. Once again, 12 months on the left, 21 months on the right. Stayed with low fat mice. IL-6, substantially lower here for the uh, fruit and veg mice after 21 months. 
Likewise, TNFA alpha, tumor necrosis factor, lower in uh, the uh, fruit and veg fed mice and blood, I forget now what that is, KCGRO, again, I'm thinking, um, probably an, an inflammatory marker of some dis description. Again, lower and maintained in, uh, considerably maintained in the um, low-fat mice. And finally, IL-10, which is um, anti-inflammatory, oddly enough, um, you know, sort of low, lower seems in fruit-fed mice, um, but suppose this this did not reach statistical significance. And is that it? Yes, that that is it. But uh, anyway, interesting study, not particularly surprising, but uh, the first time I've seen a lifespan study uh, in terms of uh, sort of food being conducted, and uh, just as good reminder to uh, make sure try to eat as much as many uh, fruit and veggies as you can, the greater the variety, the better. And um, yeah, hopefully the researchers will will conduct this experiment again um, and actually follow the, uh, the mice for the, the entirety of their lives. On to the next study. And keeping with the fruit and vegetable theme, this study is in carrots, or at least a new molecule found in carrots. Now, the researchers were looking for new molecules which could uh, retard aging, and they employed the strategy of uh, screening for molecules which could activate NRF2, which is a master regulator of um, detoxification, as well as, uh, as molecules which could activate AMPK, which is activated during cal calorific restriction. And they screen like 1,200 or so molecules. And you can see here uh, in graph D that uh, this bar graph here, which, which shows uh, activation of NRF2, they had a few hits. Now, on the right hand side are some positive controls, um, well known molecules, which um, let's say activate NRF2. And the most famous one probably is uh, sulforaphane, which is found in um, which is found in uh, broccoli or high, highest concentrations in broccoli. And they found one molecule called isophalcarintriol or IFT. I think I'll stick with IFT, uh, which um, exceeded the activation of NRF two of uh, for, by uh, sulforaphane. So they sort of continued with this um, IFT molecule. And they next tested it out in um, C. elegans, a worm, and did a survival um, lifespan study. And you can see the survival uh, curves here, the black line being uh, placebo worms, and the orange, I guess for carrots, uh, line being the survival curve for those worms uh, fed um, IFT. Now, they then also tested um, out worms which had NRF2 knocked out, so they didn't express that anymore, and the survival curves were pretty much the same. Next, they took a look at, to find out what uh, the structure was, which you can sort of see here. We won't sort of delve into that, it's sort of beyond my pay grade. And uh, they did various other experiments to see exactly how it worked. And one way that it worked was uh, by reducing um, ATP production, which in turn uh, activates AMPK. And again, this is what happens um, if you uh, practice uh, calorific restriction. I won't go into, go into the full details there. And um, again, they, they also found that uh, this... As a result, it impairs the mitochondrial respiration in cells, which again, might not sound good, but actually is good for longevity. And here it gets more interesting again. Um, they tested out, and if you look at survival curves E here, it's actually they gave the worms paraquet, which is, um, I believe, a herbicide, and adding uh, IFT at um, increased their lifespan under this uh, potent toxic chemical. And on the on F here are worms, which um, are sort of Alzheimer worms. If worms can get Alzheimer's, or at least they they are they have some uh, memory defects. Or and um, once again, uh, IFT increased their lifespans here. 
However, perhaps more interesting, they also tested it out on various cancer cell lines. Um, so you look at J, K, and L, uh, L here. J is breast ca uh, breast cancer type. K is liver cancer, and I is uh, colon cancer. And it's slightly reduced um, uh, incidence of or the growth of um, number of colonies here of uh, breast cancer. Still, though, still uh, it was statistically significant. However, it <laughs> radically reduced or probably. Um, eradicated the the liver cancer and colon cancer cell lines here next they tested they, they moved up the um, animal kingdom into mice and they first tested it in uh, obese mice and I can see sort of a fat mouse there sure which, which which had been fed a high fat diet though they couldn't see the age of the mice but I guess they were middle-aged or younger mice. And you can see that it had an effect on the um, glucose sensitivity, B and D here for male and female mice. You can see the, uh, once again, orange is for IFT. And so a, sl a slightly lower glucose spike and also just the, the fasted glucose levels were reduced um, by IFT, more so in the males than in the females, but still a reduction in both and additionally it increased the number of uh, mitochondria in the cells so a uh, copy number of mitochondrial dna so much the um and once again in males and females uh yeah there was an increase in for both sexes and in addition it also increase their uh, endurance you can actually see here on, on j here is worms once again and body bends per second slightly more for in uh, cl agains here on the right uh, k and l we have uh, mice uh, time until exhaustion so that they were put on a treadmill and they had to run until they basically gave up and both for male and female mice there was an improvement M males just fell a little bit short of statistical significance, which is 0 0.07. But the uh, females um, had a quite considerable gain. In fact, the females outran the males in all conditions there. Next, they then tried, they tested, they tested this out on, get a bigger, bigger uh, screen here, um, image here on aged mice so they they test they, they wait till mice were actually 16 months old um, before they started giving them ift and once again they tested uh, we can see the the uh, study design here what what ages they tested various um various parameters and once again they uh, had a look at uh, glucose and both in male and female mice, the glucose sensitivity increased. You can see here, the orange line is below that of the gray. Uh, actually, hold on. I, I uh, tell a lie. Um, it, 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 there was a difference in uh, the male mice. However, in the female mice, there wasn't so much so much of a difference. Even in fact, perhaps slightly worse. In and also for, um, however, for the sort of the fasted glucose, the sort of base levels of glucose. And there was actually there was no change for the males and an improvement for the females. So go figure for what these differences mean. They also uh, tested the fra um, uh, tested the frailty index, and you can see here over from twenty two to thirty three months in the male mice and twenty two to thirty one months in the female mice. Not sure why that. Not sure why that. Not sure why they stopped there, but you can see that uh, lower is better. And for at each of these different time points, the um, the mice had a lower frailty frailty index score, and also their phenotypic age, which is primarily based on the frailty index, but not entirely, um, was also low, lower for both sexes. Though for the females, it didn't reach um, statistical significance after. 31 months of a p-value of 0.12. So statistical significance is when the p-value goes below 0.05. So it's one in 20 chance of, of um, the results being 
by chance. They also found, um, did a few more tests and found that there were some sex, sex differences as well, as you can see here at the, the uh, oh, sort of the bottom, hold on, we'll get to, get to that in a second. Firstly, they also tested time, um, the endurance and the combination of male and females showed at 18 months uh, greater endurance. Again, once again, time until exhaustion. Overall, the frailty index was lower. This grimace, um, sort of pain perception, uh, was less in um, the IFT treated mice, and the uh, the breathing was uh, also um, was better in uh, in the mice of both sexes. However, there were some sex differences. So, for example, on the left here under N, male mice had greater grip strength. This wasn't seen in females. However, females had better heart rate variability, which is good, and this. Um, CV, which again, I just remind myself, let's see, coefficient of variation, which was higher, I suppose a good thing. And both the white blood cell and lymphocyte counts were lower in the uh, female mice, which is a good thing once again, and uh, anti-inflammatory cytokines, IL-4, IL-10, were higher in the female mice. So lots of things improved. Um, by in the mice which were given IFT. Unfortunately, the, the um, researchers also tested, they also tell, tested lifespan in the supplementary figure. And he says, we did not, we did not see an increase in murine lifespan. Murine means mice, basically, though they do say strong evidence that uh, IFT prolongs the health span of aged mice. Now, in the discussion, I just want to end on something they said. One thing um, they mentioned, which is um, perhaps ben ben beneficial for this new molecule, is the fact that it was much more potent than a lot of uh, other sort of similar molecules, such as resveratrol, curcumin, quercetin, and epicatechin 3 gallate, which is uh, EGCG, which is the main component in uh, green tea. And they're sort of saying that these, th those particular substances needed high doses in, in mice to have an effect. So for the resveratrol, 300 milligrams per kilogram of food, for common green tea, it was over 2000 milligrams uh, per kilogram of food. And that those doses supposedly exceeded uh, the doses of IFT by a factor of hundreds to thousands. Therefore, we anticipate that isofalcarintriol exhibits enhanced bioavailability and or increased potency as a natural anti-aging agent in contrast to previously documented structures. And also the fact that it's found in carrots, easily obtainable. It's a promis promising uh, nutraceutical and a uh, new molecule for our the armatorium of anti-aging or longevity. Well, I guess this is an increased longevity, but um, health span helping agents. Finishing off with a pair of studies looking at CD38, which is an inflammatory marker which increases with age. As it is a primary consumer of NAD, it is the main reason why NAD levels decline with age. The first study looked at its effects on ovaries. Now, it is well known that the ovaries are the first major organ system to fail due to aging. The question is, however, why does it fail? Why do uh, women, why do women's uh, fertility decline so much faster than men's? Now, the researchers here uh, took a look at uh, the ovaries of um, middle-aged. Uh, mice comparing those to the ovaries of uh, young two-month-old mice. And they found that, um, again, no big surprise, we knew, knew this already, that markers of senescence, P16 and P21, are much higher in the ovaries than the other major organs. So the blue is two-month-old mice, red is eight-month-old mice. And you can see here markers of these, these senescent markers are much higher in the ovary than the other than the other organs. And 
Not only that, but markers of inflammation here, 1A all the way to TNF, are once again uh, higher um, in uh, the ovaries at eight months old than it is than they are in uh, the other other tissues. Less so with some of them, but certainly for IL-6, IL-10, TNF, it's they are substantially um, substantially higher. And yeah, just more indication here, just it's higher in the ovaries. Another way of another way of looking at things here. Next, um, they also it's well known, not well known perhaps, but they surmise that uh, it was this molecule CD38, which was the cause of this. And they looked at the expression of CD38 in the ovaries of uh, the mice. You can see here actually the NAD pathway if you're interested and amongst all these various aspects of the um, NAD pathway so the ones um, things which cause it NAD to increase and things which consume NAD so I mean the, the sirtuins famously are consumers of NAD and that's um, that's a sort of a good thing because they sort of they protect us however CD38 massively um, at eight months old once again blue is two months the red is eight months at eight months the um, levels of cd38 have shot up majorly and this in turn go more to the bottom you can see here levels of cd38 shoot up again this in turn leads to a decrease in levels of NAD. And look at G here. So once again, blue is two months, eight is uh, red is eight months, but they've added gray of 12 months. And you can see there's a precipitous decline in NAD levels in the ovary, which is not shared by the other organs of, um, of a mouse. Next, they took a look at um, seen that already. Next, they took a look at what happens when uh, they, um, CD38 is just knocked out of a genetically modified mouse. And what they found was that this led to... So here, uh, the blue is normal wild-type mice. Uh, red is the um, CD38 null, or knocked out mice. And on the left here, under A, you can see that NAD levels are much higher in the uh, knockout mice, though they still do decline. And that leads, this however, leads to higher um, well, the weight of the ovaries. And uh, on the right here under D, number of pups per female, so number of um, babies born, basically, and in the, um, the, the numbers are higher in the um, CD38 knockout mice. And uh, number of follicles also increases in the, in the knockout mice under various uh, 2, 8, and 12 months. I won't go into all these details here. So getting rid of uh, CD, uh, CD38 uh, genetically, it shows beneficial res uh, results. And uh, it also, I'm going to go into this, the very dense uh, figure here, but it uh, CD38 deletions, as it says, reversed aging-related cell type specific gene expression changes. And also, uh, basically, the transcriptome um, reverted back to uh, normal again if um, if CD38 was knocked out. Again, it's a bit too dense and detailed for uh, our liking, hopefully. Although, of course, feel free to take a look at these studies in your own time. Now, uh, when CD38 was knocked out, they um, also, if you look here, um, I won't go into it, but again, other improvements. So abnormal spindles, I'm not, a, I'm not a fertility expert, but abnormal spindles decline considerably um, in the CD38 knockout mice. And uh, um, yeah, so that, that would be a good thing. Now, 
the next what they next did was um see what happens when they tried to initiate inflammation in the mouse using liposaccharide uh and uh which caught which um so they injected mice with this um inflammatory uh molecule and looked at the effects it would have so a normal mice this was and uh won't delve into this fully but you can sort of see here uh actually well let's take a zip in quickly you can see here um blue is controlled red is the um mice injected with this inflammatory and again cd with the injection of that inflammatory um the cd38 shot up as did various other uh inflammatory markers Again, the same sort of similar sort of uh, gene expression. Um, you know, once again, just goes up considerably. And this had an impact on um, NAD levels. They went down, just looking at concentrating the blue and red here. And uh, the follicles also um, went down. And uh, yeah, cytoplasmic fox foxo three, not sure what that is, went up. So again, bad things happened. Um, and well, when uh, when uh, CD thirty eight goes up, this time due to um, inflammatory. However, the question is, how can this be stopped? Um, because obviously, you're not going to uh, knock out genetically knock out. Uh, CD38 in humans, at least not yet, maybe eventually with CRISPR technology advancing. So they used, um, they then used a CD38 inhibitor, which is called um, 78C, and I injected that into eight month old mice for eight days and took a look at what happened. And here are the results. So they found firstly that uh, once again, blue is control, red is mice, which were given this, uh, this 78C. And NAD, as you can see here on the left, NAD levels increased substantially, very high, good p-value. I'm not sure actually what the B, this AMH levels, but it went up and I think that's supposedly a good thing. However, the, the mean litter size, so how many pups were born per mouse, I guess, increased those given C, um, 78C. And the number of oocytes, I guess uh, eggs basically increased as well. And the number, the percentage of abnormal ones decreased considerably. And I guess these pictures show uh, ab on the left wild type on the right 78C and I guess you want you want the eggs to look like mice and round without these abnormal things happening, and those abnormal things happening happened less if they were given seventy eight C. And once again here, abnormal spindles. I guess these are pictures of these spindles, abnormal or not, uh, decreased substantially when seventy eight C was given to the mice. So it's good to know that there is a way of reversing this increase in CD38. Now, one thing to mention, let's get rid of that ad. One thing to mention is the fact that um, C, uh, 78C, there's some issues with it. I don't think, I don't think it can be used in humans. However, it gives a basis to developing other drugs as well as you see in a moment, but there's also um, natural compounds such as apigenin found in parsley and celery and uh, quercetin, which supposedly use CD38 levels, though I think um, you'd have to take several kilos of <laughs> parsley a day to actually make a difference. So there are supplements out there. I'm not sure if they've been fully tested for uh, CD38 reduction. However, back to here. Um, however, our the second study we're going to look at involves the discovery of or the um, creation of a 
new way of, of getting CD38 levels down. So let's take a look at that. Instead of looking at the ovaries, the researchers in this study looked at systemic sclerosis, a chronic disease characterized by fibrosis in multiple organs. And uh, let's get rid of that annoying ad on the side, if we can, just make this bit bigger. There we go. There it's gone. The researchers and uh, CD38 increases with uh, that disease, the fibro fri fibrotic disease. And just firstly, they just um, looked at, uh, here's a cycle, uh, NAD cycle on the left here. And when they injected mice uh, with bleomycin, uh, an inflammatory agent, it increased CD38 expression in the skin. And uh, then they took a look at, they developed this um, um, antibody, which they called AB68, antibody 68. There's a heavy chain one, which I'm not sure exactly what that means, but anyway, that's doesn't 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 really matter. And in this first uh, first study, they injected mice once again with uh, bleomycin, and then they also were injected twice a week with um, either AB68 or AB69. The only difference is that um, AB69 was an inactive antibody AB68 was the one which was the anti-CD38. Lots of numbers, I know. And they had a look at what um, effect that had on the skin of the mice. And you can see here, and here's this sort of cross, cross section. Um, hard to make out exactly what the difference is, except that AB68, the skin looks more like the control than... Uh, uh, um, than the AB69 when it's given uh, bleomycin. And looking at um, the dermal thickness on the right here, AB68 uh, reduced uh, at comparable effect to, to the control mice where placebo just um, had um, thicker uh, dermal thickness. And you can see in terms of body weight here, look at, looking at C, the uh, AB68 mice had uh, less body weight reduction when they were given this, uh, given this toxin. Hydroproline was also more similar to um, the control mice. Col 1A1 expression was also similar, and these other, these other markers uh, were, were not as elevated as they were in the... Um, in the uh, sort of the sham treated mice plus this toxin. So a good sign so far. And uh, next they looked at uh, the lung, the effects it would have. And uh, you can see the lung looking at, uh, once again, a cross section and just the cross section of the AB68. Uh, treated mice, um, again, the, these mice were treated with this toxin, which causes fibrosis. Um, the lung cross-section looks more similar to the uh, un, un, uh, the normal mice. And uh, once again, in terms of the lung fibrosis score, it was uh, lower. So we got the control mice, which did not get the toxin. The mice uh, on the left, in the middle, are the mice which were given the toxin, plus the... Um, null or non-working antibody and uh, uh, the, the column on the right is the uh, mice given the toxin plus the um, um, full flavor antibody shall we say so lower levels of lung fibrosis lower levels of hydroxyproline and also lower levels um, similar to the un, uh, untreated mice for uh, these various other markers of lung fibrosis. However, more importantly, perhaps, is what the actual effects this had on, um, on their lung functionality. And here we can see uh, inspiratory capacity, forced vital capacity, forced expiratory capacity, and peak compliance. All of these scores were higher uh, with the AB68 treated mice, which is obviously a good thing. And 
So um, final figures we're going to look at here, figure four, we're just looking generally at um, what effect in the skin this AB68 had in terms of CD38 activity. And you can see here on the left in A, it was substantially reduced. And with B here, it showed that um, in, oh, sorry, this is not skin, sorry, this is in the muscles. So they, so they took a look at the effect this would have on muscles. And they also saw that uh, NAD levels increased substantially in the AB68 mice. And you can see both for the CD38 activity and AD levels, there was a dose um, response level in terms of the derm dermal thickness, at least in terms of th these levels. Yes, oh, and also they found in D here that um, NMN levels, precursor for um, NAD and a key player in the NAD cycle, NMN levels increased with uh, the addition of AB68. And one thing that NAD is used for, it's used by the sirtuin uh, class of enzymes, and which are considered sort of well, considered by some to be sort of longevity molecules, but it's still controversial, not necessarily a slam dunk case. Um, in each of these cases, levels of SIR T1 and SIR T3 increased. You can see, um, yeah, yeah, between the uh, untreated or the ones given the sham injection and the ones given the AB68. So the SIR2 levels increased, which can also be seen on this bar chart on the right hand side so nad levels go up and also 31 levels go up as well so this is a sort of quite promising research that um, as, as mentioned pr previously c78 these numbers um can't really be used in humans it sort of says here why um not c78 78c because it, I suppose you see 78C crosses the blood brain barrier, and we don't necessarily want it to do that. So, uh, whereas this um, heavy chain antibody doesn't, and so it is theoretically safer for humans to use. Now, the researchers did not test this out in ovaries, so we should maybe hook them up with those, the other researchers, and see if it ha would have the same effect on ovaries as it seems to have on um, skin, lung, and muscle levels of CD38. But anyway, it's promising that we have potential means of reducing this inc the increase in this CD38 molecule, which causes all of these problems throughout our bodies. Anyway, we've reached the end of this month's review and so thank you if you stayed this far uh thank you for watching and uh, before you leave please give a like to this video for that uh, youtube algorithm um subscribe to this channel and if you really like the work or you want to support the work the canadian longevity association is doing to improve the health and longevity of canadians please give us a um, donation every little bit helps as we are still starting out and there is a link to our donation donations page below this video as well anyway until next month cheerio